Oh, you grow the best vegetables in Northwest Ohio? Prove it. In today's world, if you can't back up your claims, you're going to have a hard time in business. The good news is that sometimes just a few tweaks are all that's needed to gain the trust of potential new buyers. And that's why in today's episode, we're going to talk about 10 different ways that you can show your brand's authority to build credibility and social proof and get those people ready to say yes and buy now. Let's get started. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 176 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I'm your host, Corinna Bench, one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farms CSA out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers get more confident in their marketing and sales strategy so that you can grow a profitable farm business. How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to the show. All of my regular listeners, a big shout out to you, especially those of you who are binge listening and this is episode number two or three of the day. I love that. And if you're new to the podcast, I'm really glad you're here today. I hope you find some value in this episode and that it whets your appetite to maybe go check out some of my other stuff. I have 175 episodes before this one. And I know that sounds a little overwhelming, but I encourage you to go check out the first 10 because if you're looking for kind of like a a marketing 101 fundamentals course, um, because I know a lot of farmers don't have any marketing background. We just sort of know how to make our products awesome, but we don't necessarily know how to sell them because... If you're like me, you didn't go to business school, right? So I designed those first 10 episodes to really help farmers kind of get the core fundamentals in place and try to understand them so you can connect the dots. Uh, Really good stuff there. So I'm really glad you guys are all here. Um, My boys have been in school now for a full week and I'm getting back into the routine and rhythm of... Uh, Yeah, having no one at home during the day and getting used to driving my son Jed out to his school, which is about a 30 minute commute one way. I have to do that twice a day now. And that really eats into my time and my gas budget. Um, But we're getting through it. And I'm making the most of that time in the car with him. He's trapped in there with me and I'm making him have many crucial conversations with me. It's awesome. Um, But yeah, I'm enjoying this new season of my life and I'm starting to work on some projects too for my digital farmer. Um, Those of you who have filled out that survey over the last few weeks for me, if you don't know about that, go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash survey and answer, I think it's 10 questions. You can do it in like five minutes. And that gives me a ton of awesome feedback on what you like about this show or what I'm teaching you, how you've grown, um, what you wish I would do more of, and it's helping me kind of shape the future of my digital farmer as I move into the winter months here. But I've got some really cool things that I'm now plotting and planning uh, for November, December. And yes, I am going to be um, relaunching CSA Quick Start for those of you who are wondering about that. Um, That will either be in December or January, but we have some plans for that. Anyway, lots of cool stuff up ahead, and I'm super excited about it. Well, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that this year my sponsor is Localine, and they have some exciting news to share. They recently launched Local Pay. Now, Local Pay is the first online payment gateway built for farmers. Think Square, Stripe, Apple Pay, PayPal, but built for farm commerce. Today, paying 2.9% plus a 30 cent fee is a widely accepted cost of online sales, but paying nearly 3% on every order adds up in an already low margin industry, am I right? So Localine built Local Pay to offer fair transaction costs to farmers. 
Farms who connect local pay to their local line accounts can now get transaction fees for as low as 2% plus 15 cents per transaction. And at the end of the day, this small change just takes 10 minutes to implement and it's going to increase your profit margin by three to 5% per year. Three to 5%, you guys. Getting connected to local pay is easy. All you have to do is have a local line account and complete an easy five minute application. Before you know it, you could be saving hundreds of dollars in fees each year. Now, if you want to learn more about how you can set up a local line account, local line is offering a premium feature for free to all of my podcast listeners when you use my coupon code, Digital Farmer 2022. So head to my affiliate link, mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash local line to learn more about that offer, then enter in that coupon code Digital Farmer 2022. Terms and conditions apply. For more information, check out the link in my show notes. Farmers, let's rethink online payments. So if you were hired by a business to be the marketing firm and come up with a marketing strategy for this business, one of the things that you would be trying to do is create what's called brand authority. And there are actual strategies that you learn about when you study marketing for how to go about doing this. And brand authority is all about trying to show your potential client that you are the guide, that you can guide them to the solution to their problem, or you can give them what it is that they desire, that your product or service is the perfect thing to help them with their problem. And so we need to establish credibility as the guide. We need to show people that we do indeed know what we're talking about, that we do have a quality product, that we are experts, and we need to build trust with these potential clients, right? So if we deliver our solution and we pitch it and say, this is what I think you should purchase, this is the service I offer, I can get you results, that client is going to take that all in, consider it and weigh the options, but before they're going to be ready to say yes, they're going to be looking for some kind of credibility piece. They need to know that you're not just making this up, but that you actually have authority in your field. So when you study marketing and when you build a marketing strategy, this is something that you think about and you actually create little moments in the customer journey that are going to deliver this brand authority that are going to hint at your credibility and therefore build trust. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of this podcast talking about is what are some of these tactics and strategies that are used by businesses um, when they're trying to market their products? How are they trying to get at this brand authority piece? How are they trying to prove that they're the expert, that they are a credible source and product? And we're going to walk through 10 different kinds of ways that this can be done. And your goal or my goal for you as you listen to this is not to say you've got to do all 10 of these. It's just a selection of options. And as you hear them, you're going to probably think of some actual products that you've purchased or services that you've purchased where these particular elements were at play in your customer experience and that helped you feel comfortable and ready to say yes and to buy the product. And my goal is not only to kind of showcase what some of these can be, but maybe you'll decide that there's one or two of them that you can easily implement. Because I'm telling you, (laughs) this piece has to fire in the customer journey. You can give all kinds of data and information that your customer can research, show them the price, and tell them all the things that it's going to do. But they're going to need to see some kind of social proof and credibility. They need to have that moment. So you've got to build that into your customer journey somewhere. And 
you also want to be thinking about the timing of like, when does that moment happen in the journey, right? Like we have these moments during the sales process when we're pitching the product, but we also want to have them sometimes during the product fulfillment stage when the person's actually purchased it and they're experiencing the results of the product. There are moments of credibility and trust and brand authority happening there too. So I want you to listen to this list. One or two of them, you're probably going to say, hey, I do that already. And that's awesome. Great job. That means you've got some of this already in your customer journey, but maybe you need to systematize it. Maybe you need to make it so that it happens every single time, that it's repeatable. And that way, every customer experience has some consistency to it. Um, But you're also going to hear some things that maybe you've never thought of before that would be quick wins, easy things to add on. And you may be surprised that adding one of these or two of these to your marketing and sales system might make way more of a difference than you might think. Because like I said, people are often ready to tip over to the other side and buy your product. And all they need is that last little piece, that credibility, that testimonial, that moment of social proof for them to tip the scales and then be ready to click the buy now button. So man, if that's all you have to provide, this one little thing might be the ticket. So I hope you find this list valuable. Um, Let me start out by telling a story. A few months ago now, my husband and I needed to redo our estate plan. We had done this a long time ago after our children were born, but we wanted to update it. It's been about 10 years and we thought it was worth taking a look at it. And the lawyer that we used before, we just didn't really love that experience. Um, And so we wanted to find a new person. And I remember going into my CSA's private Facebook group actually, because I have so many people in there that I trust. And I asked the question to my group, hey, We're trying to redo our farm estate plan. Does anybody know a really good lawyer that they would recommend? And I got about 15 or 20 responses from different people. And several of them mentioned a particular person, uh, Mr. Chamberlain. And uh, he actually turns out he's in my CSA. And at first I was like, was that going to be weird? that I'm going to ask him as a customer to work for me. And I'm like, no, that's actually really cool. That'd be awesome. But so many people said something positive about him. And there was one person in particular who I really trust. Her name is Esther. And um, yeah, for, I, for whatever reason, like I really trusted her opinion. And the fact that she said so many good things about him, I was like, all right, that's that's who we're going with. And so that process began and I reached out to him and I said, hey, here's the situation. We want to do this thing. And we kind of got the whole sales pitch. I could probably do a whole podcast episode on his sales funnel. Maybe I'll do that someday. And Rich, I know that you sometimes listen to my show. So that'd be funny if my lawyer is actually listening. Um, so anyway, we I go into his office. Uh, there's a, a moment when we have to actually sit down and... Um, like sign the documents, right? And there's this impressive looking conference room with all these leather backed chairs and a long table. And on the walls, you see his diplomas. And, um, you know, he's he comes into the room, and he's wearing a nice suit. And, you know, as I was reflecting for this podcast, I was thinking about, man, there were lots of moments in those interactions with my lawyer where there was crazy social proof and credibility going on. And I thought I would just point out a few of them in this story, but then I'm going to go through a big list here at the end of the podcast or the the meat of the podcast and kind of point out to you that all of these little side dressings kind of matter. Um, So things like having an impressive conference room, like that's something you would expect a lawyer to have. It's almost part of his persona and his uh, brand. And so if they don't have an impressive conference room, you sort of wonder, is this person legit, right? Um, The fact that there were diplomas on the wall, a subtle thing. Did I actually look at them in detail? No, but I I noticed them. Um, The fact that he has a book. I remember when I first went in and met with his assistant, I don't even remember what I was doing. 
if I was setting up an appointment or dropping off some information to them. But she said, here, read this. And she gave me like a published book, a self-published book that he had written that was all about estate planning 101. And it was, I don't know, like probably 100, 120 pages, something you could get through in a weekend. And immediately I was like, hot dang, this guy wrote a book and it just raised the level of like, he knows what he's doing. He has a book out on the topic, right? He's an expert in his field. And after we finally signed all the documents and we were kind of shaking hands and leaving, I remember he dropped this little nugget. He's like, oh yeah, I have a podcast. I started a podcast. And I was like, no way, I have a podcast too. And we kind of chatted about that. And I'm leaving, I'm thinking he has a podcast. Like that's also going to add credibility. That whole experience, you know, we ended up choosing to go with him. We ended up signing the documents. Um, He was our guy and it was really great. Uh, I'll be writing a nice testimonial for him in the future too. Uh, But along the way, in that process of selling and then actually executing and delivering the service to us, there were so many moments where his credibility was being... uh, pushed at me, not pushed at me, but was being hinted at. I was seeing evidence of, yes, this guy knows what he's doing. Yes, he's quality. Yes, you can trust him. Other people have trusted him. Okay. And that's what I want to kind of talk about today, that it's important when you are building a business that you are creating these experiences, these touch point moments along the buyer's journey. So when they're actively uh, pursuing kind of looking into whether or not they want to work with you. So during the sales process, but also during the execution process, when you're actually receiving the service, there should be these touch point moments when you as a business are dropping little credibility bombs, okay? And just reassuring the customer that, yes, this person knows what they're doing. Yes, this person is an expert. Yes, you did the right thing. Now, why is this important for the customer? Well, you may have noticed when you go out and purchase something that before you decide to buy something, you often are looking for these little tokens of social proof and credibility. Whether, I I always pick on Amazon, but uh, I do buy from Amazon quite a bit actually, and my boys are really into tech stuff. And they're often looking around at different versions of things. And we will use the the stars and the ratings and the reviews to help us decide between one or two different models of something. Um, so there, there's social proof all around us and it is a part of the buyer's journey. In fact, I wouldn't be ready to move forward and buy that airplane kit unless I had seen social proof somewhere, unless I had heard from some source and uh, that this was a credible purchase so that I could trust that I could put this money out there into the space and it would come back to me. Okay, so um, when you're trying to sell your products to people, especially higher ticket things or subscriptions like CSAs or, you know, where they're having to spend, um, gosh, even like 100 bucks, over $100, like people want to know, like, please reduce the risk for me. And make sure that you tell me as a customer that this was a good decision. I need to see as much proof as possible. So as a business owner, I think you know this, but as a business owner, in your sales process, at the very least, you should have a few moments, a few uh, tools that are kind of meeting this need for the customer and showing them social proof, showing them signs of credibility so they can trust you. They can say, yep. I saw that testimonial. Oh, I saw that review. Oh, I saw that statistic. And they feel comfortable moving forward and taking the next step, which is often by now, okay? Don't leave this out. Um, And oftentimes what I find is that um, a business owner simply has to add this element in the right spot, in the right time, and it converts the customer. Like that's all they're waiting for. And it's a simple thing to add and boom, you've closed the loop for them and now they're ready to move forward. So I really hope this episode is going to give you some ideas for what a credibility moment could look like, a social proof moment could look like, so that you can quickly just drop them in in various places. And I think you're going to be astounded by how much of a difference it makes. Okay, so are you ready? I'm going to jump into my 10 different ways that you can show this brand authority 
and build this credibility and trust, okay? Let's start, they're not in any really particular order. I just kind of jotted them down. Um, let's start with the first one. And the first one is awards, diplomas, and certifications. Now think back to that lawyer example. When I walked into his office, I saw his diploma. When you walk into a doctor's office, every doctor puts their medical degree, their diploma from their medical school somewhere in at least one of the rooms so that you can see it, right? It's a subtle sign that, hey, I'm legit. I went to school for a long time and spent a lot of money and went into debt to become a doctor and I know my craft. So if you have any kind of awards that you have won as a farm business, maybe you got featured in a big time uh, national or local or regional magazine or you your cheese won best in show or whatever, like talk about that. Put a big freaking badge on that product in your online store so that people see it and go, oh, this was the award-winning cheese for such and such magazine in 2021, dang, I'm going to get it, right? You will immediately see an uptake in people wanting to buy that product. Or if there's something like most popular, right? The thing that always sells out, bestseller, putting those kinds of, um, that's essentially an award that you've made up yourself, but putting those kinds of badges onto your products helps the customer see this is what everybody likes, this is what everyone buys, and that's got to be the winner, if you have certifications like uh, certified organic, um, put that up there on your, put it on your website, post it on your sign. If you make labels for any of your products, you stick it on there. Make sure people know that you have that because that raises and elevates your brand. And sometimes I feel like it justifies a price increase as well. Okay. But it tells them, hey, someone else, a third party certified this person. They said they're legit. And um, somehow that makes that brand kind of elevate. Okay, so that's number one. Maybe that's a quick tip or a quick tweak that you can do. Um, you can go onto your website and just add um, like a bar somewhere on your homepage of your website where you put some different logos of your certifications or awards. Okay, the second one, and this is kind of a funny one to, to, to list second, but a long line or being sold out, sold out status. This is another huge way to build credibility and trust and social proof. So um, for example, if you are at the farmer's market and you probably have see some, maybe you're one of these vendors, but have you ever seen a vendor who has like 12 people waiting in line to get their product? I know we used to see a couple of people like that when we went to the farmer's market and we were always a little jealous um, because <laughs> we wanted to have that line, right? We're like, why don't we have that? Um, but if you see crowds of people around one particular booth, like that's a form of social proof. Now, I don't know if you can really engineer that, but I just want you to be aware if you're one of those people that has that, oh my gosh, milk it. Like that is a great thing to have because people will look around and see why is everyone congregating over there? I know my mother-in-law, Bench Farms, um, they sell amazing sweet corn and they are kind of known as the best sweet corn in this area. And part of it is like they have these ridiculous long lines at their Perrysburg Farmer's Market just to get the corn, okay? And now we've got even more people that want to buy her corn because they're all like, why is there a huge line? Well, it's because her corn's so amazing. You should try it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to get in line with you and see if you're right. Okay. So having a long line, super cool. If you have that going for you, way to go. Um, try to figure out how to get a long line <laughs> at your booth. Um, but even just this idea of a wait list. So if you are sold out um, and people can't get into a product anymore, that also is a form of credibility and social proof. Your product is so popular that you can't even get it all the time and you got to get onto a special list. So this is really like gone crazy for us with our CSA the last couple of years. We start collecting a CSA wait list. Um, well, as of a couple of months ago, I started talking about it more in earnest, um, but we sold out as some of you may know, within like three days when we did our CSA early bird sign up last fall, um, we sold out our summer season within three or four days. And um, 
that was the first time that had ever happened. And I immediately had to start collecting a wait list. And I had people begging me to get in. Um, I've even heard of people, not farms, but I've heard of other institutions who have wait lists who charge people to be on the wait list. <laughs> and uh, which I think is kind of gutsy. Anyway, um, here's what's happening now, though. It's interesting because I'm about to begin the process of doing my early bird renewal launch for promotion for my current CSA members to try to get them to sign up again early. That starts in October is kind of when I'm running that for seven days. And so I'm gearing up for that right now. And I'm beginning to talk about my wait list. And hey, if you want to be on my CSA next year, you're pretty much going to have to get on the wait list if you want to have a chance because we do typically get really close to selling out. And so I need you to be on this list so that you're one of the first people to be offered those last spots once my current members get a chance you know, to take the, the ones that we're offering next year first. And uh, this process of talking about the wait list is a form, uh, it's a promotional exercise. And it is actually populating my email list right now. I'm getting more and more people on the CSA wait list. And it's creating this credibility, this trust, this social proof, like just talking about how you have a wait list. So I spend a lot of time on that. But I just want to make you aware that sometimes you can create false scarcity, like you can um, maybe say, well, we only have, maybe you actually have 50 spots, but you're going to, you know, close it off at 30 once you hit 30 and then you tell people we have a wait list. And then those other people, you fill those other 20 spots a few months later when you kind of open it up again and you let those people on the wait list know, right? And now they're, they, they fill it in. So it's a kind of a fun thing to play around with. Okay. That was a long one. Let's move on to number three. Number three is statistics. Statistics are a great way that you can leverage credibility and social proof. So things like um, the number of Instagram followers. I hate using that one. Um, but like when I look at, a, at an account and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at all the people that are following them. It does kind of elevate them and like this must be a really good farm, right? Or the number of customers. So if you talk about we serve this many customers or I can tell people, we have this many customers in our CSA. I have 425 members. Um, that people are like, whoa, that's a that's a large CSA. Like they must know what they're doing, right? That creates trust and credibility. Talking about your retention rate, if you're a CSA and you have a really high one, like ours is was 92% last year. But if you have a high retention rate, oh my gosh, talk about that. Say, hey, 92% of the people last year decided to come back, which means that most of the people really like it. Put that on your sales page wherever you are trying to sell your CSA so that people know that information. Um, on my on my website, we have a section like a little bar that moves that's a scrolling bar of our latest testimonials that have come through on Google or Google reviews. So the number of five-star reviews or just frankly having any kind of reviews, um, those are statistics that you want to show people. If people are coming to search for you on Google and they type in like organic farm near me or they actually type in the name of your farm business, the, the Google My Business page or excuse me your google business profile is going to pop up and they're going to see the number of reviews it's one of the things that google will do and so if you have a a larger number of reviews showing up than the competition underneath you the person's probably going to look at your website first so that is definitely a statistic that you want to cultivate it's one of the reasons why i talk about how important it is to um, ask people for Google reviews. I'll make sure I link up in the show notes today um, a, the episode where you can learn more about how to get better at getting Google reviews because this is a super important statistic to try and um, shore up so that you can talk about it. Um, number of years in business, that's another statistic that will earn you some street cred. So if you've been around for 20 years as opposed to this farm over here that's only been around for three, it just gives you a little bit more weight, right? Um, yeah, so those are just some of the statistics I could think of. And these are things that you can put onto your website, onto your sales page. Find ways to um, to place that. If you want to go to my, my farm's website, sharedlegacyfarms.com, you can actually look at an example of a website where I drop several examples of, of 
different kinds of social proof. So as we go through this episode, you'll listen, you'll hear some other ones, but go take a look, see what you see. I'm pretty sure I use um, certifications. I think I have some badges on there. I definitely have reviews. I have the number of customers. I mentioned my retention rate. Um, I have a price, a pretty higher, higher premium price. Yeah. So just, you can kind of look there and see, do have a little audit um, exercise to see where, what are some examples of where she's building credibility and trust? And what does that actually look like in practice on a piece of marketing? Okay, let's move to number four. Um, Another way that you can build social proof and credibility is if you can get someone famous to vouch for you. And I say famous like in air quotes, like it doesn't have to obviously be a super big celebrity, although if you have one of those, awesome, you should milk it. But um, it could also be someone that your customer avatar really respects and knows. So it could be another brand that you could cross, cross promote with. So we have several um, farms that we work in, that we collaborate with. And like one of them, Weber Ranch, uh, they're really popular and well-known in our area. And, you know, the fact that we work with them and we sometimes like take pictures with them going out to dinner, like the, the fact that we associate with one another and we're both kind of strong, elevated brands, like that helps raise our credibility. Another example of this might be chefs. If you have a really awesome chef in your area that you're good friends with or that your farm supports, um, showing that collaboration can make a big difference. So we have a a chef named Chef Chris Nixon from Element 112, and he is um, one of the best chefs in the state, if not the country. I know he's been nominated. I think he's been in the running for the, what is it, the James Beard Award? Am I saying that right? Um, anyway, he's, he's super good. And at least within Toledo area, people know of him and he comes out to our farm and he does one or two farm dinners for us a year. And we always take pictures of that and make a big deal about it. I know that at his restaurant, he'll mention our name on his menu, um, as part of, you know, where he sources his ingredients. And so just having, like taking a photo, Kurt will go out with him from time to time and have a beer with him because we're, we're good friends with him. And, uh, photos with him like help again elevate our brand like oh man you guys know chef nixon he comes to your farm and cooks meals for you like that's really cool and it can elevate your brand so sometimes just knowing someone famous getting them in a photo with you can do a lot to just give you some credibility and trust with your people all right moving on to number five you know i'm going to say this one ratings and reviews and testimonials they could probably be separated into two categories but i lumped them all together here Um, this is huge and i feel like it's probably one of the top two people are looking for reviews they're looking for proof that your product actually works did another person find success and get results with your product and so you want to be collecting these and if there's only one thing that you can do i feel like this is probably the most important one Um, and again i'll make sure i link up in the show notes, the episode about why testimonials are so important, how to go about collecting those reviews and storing them somewhere so that you can actually use them. But, you know, once you collect the testimonial, you want to be using it. You can post it, uh, create an image, a social image, and put it on social media. That should be in your rotation from time to time. You can put them on your website or you can add a a widget in your website that's actually pulling the latest Google reviews uh, to appear first and then they kind of scroll on your website, that's really powerful. Or you can place them in different places within your website. Um, so definitely, definitely try to, to work on ratings and reviews because people wanna know, did this work for someone else? They're actually looking for this. And here's kind of a super tip that I learned from one of my mentors. Um, you wanna have your buy now button right underneath the testimonial section. Don't make a person have to look for it because oftentimes, once they've seen the testimonial, they're convinced and they're ready. And if they have trouble finding the right button at that moment, uh, you may lose the sale. So your buy now button or whatever your call to action is should be right underneath or right above the testimonial section on your website. Okay, that's a super golden tip right there. Okay, let's move on to number six, before and after stories or pictures. This is sort of similar to testimonials, but testimonials are when somebody actually speaks out, you know, words into the world or types out a review somewhere. To, to me, the the before and after picture or the story, that's more like, a, um, like here's, 
here's what life was like before and here's what I'm doing now because of your product. Sometimes, like for us, we don't have a before shot, but we definitely have a lot of after shots. So pictures of my customers using the product or something they've made with the product, they'll share those with me. They'll send it in an Instagram story and I'll put it through my Instagram story feed um, or I'll download the picture and then I'll use it or they put it in my Facebook group and I'll download it and I'll use it on my Facebook business page or on Instagram and I'll talk about, hey, this was made by so-and-so, Danielle Cool, And it's a form of, um, like the after story, here's something that my customers are now able to do because of what we do through our program, how we give you not only the vegetables, but we teach you how to use them. And I can talk about that in my messaging, in my caption, okay? Um, this might be something you could even put onto a sales page of a website. So if you have the type of product that has very remarkable before and after results, um, you might want to use this because that sort of stuff talks <laughs> for sure. Are you a CSA farmer that wants to try out an early bird renewal promotion campaign for your current CSA members. In other words, you want to try and get your CSA members to sign up for next year early, as in this year before the year ends, but you're not quite sure how to do it or you're a little bit nervous about doing it. Well, I'm about to start that process as well. I'm going to be gearing things up here for my own members the end of September is kind of when I start what I call the pre-launch system where I build a bunch of hype. Um, but my offer will go live on the second week of October and I'm going to run it for seven days and try and get as many people as possible to renew their shares. Last year, I got 92% of them to renew and then I filled up the rest of the gap with people who were on my wait list so that I sold out within four days. Every year, that number goes up a little bit more. And I've just gotten better and better at this strategy. Now, the reason I bring this up right now is because I'm going to be offering my online course or program. It's called Early Bird Campaigns That Convert. And this has been around for a couple of years. You can learn more about it at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash early bird. And it's actually like available all the time. But this is the time of year when I really point to it and promote it because it is my step-by-step -step system for how you actually build an early bird campaign from start to finish. I include the things you could be doing if you wanna do like a build it up hype plan, which I call the pre-launch phase. I talk about how you need to build your offer. I talk about what kinds of stuff you should be putting in your sales emails. How do you use social media to promote this to your tribe? And I also uh, talk about some of the systems that you need to have in place. One of the best parts of this program is that I literally give you my entire like cheat sheet of all the social media posts and emails that I write to my members in the order in which they go out so that you can see how it worked uh, last year that gave me all those wicked results. And this is like the template that I use. I'm literally gonna go back and just pull that little sheet out and probably copy a lot of it and redo the same thing this year so once you build it the first time, you just reuse it. You tweak it and reuse it year after year. It's such a great program. I'm not sure how many of you guys even know it's there, but I wanted to bring it up today in this podcast. If you are a CSA farmer and you've always wanted to try an early, camp, early bird campaign, uh, this might be a really helpful resource for you. You can go check it out. It's at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash early bird. You can go through the course at your own pace. And it will hopefully help you get to a higher retention number earlier than you have in the past so that you can go into the new year with a little bit of assurance knowing, okay, I've got, I've got my, some of my finances settled and I don't feel as nervous about being able to achieve my sales goals. So mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash early bird. Now back to the show. All right, number seven, free samples. Uh, yeah, free samples. Now, I know some of you are like, ah, oh, but people will come and take advantage of that. Yeah, you have to kind of watch for that. But um, an example here is that my, my mother-in-law, again, they have this awesome sweet corn. And I think they still do this. Their corn's pretty pretty high priced. And um, people will kind of, first timers who don't, know, who don't know better, are like, what, you want me to pay that much for, for your sweet corn? And they'll say, 
yeah, it's it's like the sweetest corn you will ever have in your life. And they're like, okay, yeah, whatever. And they're like, no, here, try it. And they give a free ear. And they say, you know, here, have this one on for, for me on free. And you, you let me know. You come back if you want some more, you know, next week. And oftentimes they will come back and they'll say, wow, that was really good. So the free sample is powerful because number one, it can, it can actually prove that you're right. It'll give them a, a no risk way to try something, but it's also a form of showing generosity. It's like, hey, I'm going to give this to you for free. And now you've created this reciprocity. You've like enacted the law of reciprocity where there's a little bit of a feeling on this part of the person that I now owe you something in return. And especially if it was a good experience, they feel like they should come back and, and you know, patronize you and buy something from you. So um, that can sometimes work in your favor. So if you've got something really awesome that you're willing to give away a small portion of as a free sample, um, go for it. Okay, number eight. You guys are going to laugh at this one, but I think this is kind of huge. A uniform. Think about that for a minute. A uniform creates credibility and trust. Now, it's really obvious for some professions, right? Like, so a doctor walks in with a white coat and it has, he has, he or she has their name um, stenciled, not stenciled. What is that? You know what I mean? On their coat. I'm, I can't think of the word right now. Um, and it says MD, right? Like the little title after it. But they're wearing the white coat and around their neck, they've got the stethoscope. Yeah, that's their uniform. And there's something about the uniform that makes you sit up and go, huh. Or a judge in a court of law, the minute they put on the robe, uh, they have a sense of gravitas about them, right? Like we take them more seriously, we respect them. A policeman or a policewoman wearing the the uniform, like they have authority as soon as they put that on. So I just want to kind of suggest that I think there is a little bit of a uniform for a farmer. Um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking coveralls, bibs, uh, yeah, like, there, if, if, if I had to choose between two people and there was one person that was sort of wearing, looking like a farmer and one that was really well dressed, <laughs> I might think in my mind, like that person over there looks like, looks like a farmer to me. I'm going to support them. Now, I know this might not be true, but I'm just sort of bringing this to your attention. Like, just try this out. Like, if you're not wearing and looking the part of the farmer, maybe try looking the part of the farmer and see if you notice a difference. I just was intrigued by this one. I'm like, hmm, what does a uniform, what would a uniform look like for a farmer? So something to think about. Okay, number nine, um, case studies or a portfolio of your work. Oh, this one is so big. If those of you who are like flower farmers, maybe you do weddings, um, put together a portfolio of your work and put it on your website so that people can see examples. Um, or, you know, if you have like a case study, like tell a story about um, two or three different brides and how they had different goals, wanted different things, and how you were able to sculpt um, this beautiful experience of flowers in order to meet their needs. And that way, somebody who comes to your website can see the different case studies and they can perhaps see themselves in one of those case studies and say, oh, I love how she can, she's so, he or she is so diverse and they're able to like do different things um, based on the needs of the bride. I bet she could probably meet my needs too because it looks like these are also different, okay? So that is another great example of a way to build credibility. All right, and then we're on the final one, number 10, stickers on your door. <laughs> I wrote stickers. Um, this is stuff like if you are, um, if you're like, if you're a part of TripAdvisor, so if your website shows up on TripAdvisor, do you have a sticker of the TripAdvisor logo? Do you have maybe the people love us on Yelp sticker that you could put on your door or even like your credit card stickers showing that you take all different kinds of credit cards is a form of credibility, um, yeah, so credibility by association. Are there any networks or associations nearby that you could uh, become a part of and then take those stickers <laughs> and put them somewhere in your business so that people see them? All right. 
Those were my short list of 10 things that I could think of. Um, as a bonus, I might even argue that your price, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna add this one in. This might stir some feathers. Stir some feathers, stir the pot, ruffle some feathers. <laughs> um, raising your price is a way to show credibility. I want you to think about that for a minute. Remember my example with the lawyer? Um, when, when he gave me his fee, it was a lot. And I knew it was going to be a lot. But I think that if I had gone to different lawyers and I had compared them, I would be comparing the prices. And if I saw that one was significantly lower than all the other ones, um, there would have been a part of me that would have said, why? Why is this person so much lower than the other two? Maybe they're not as good. So sometimes your pricing positions you as the quality leader in the space. So for all of you farmers out there that are like me and struggle with raising your prices, you guys, I'm going to raise my CSA prices this year, like big time. And I'm really having to work through it with my coach right now so that I feel confident. Um, but if that is something that you're struggling with, I want you to just consider that sometimes raising the price suddenly elevates your brand and makes you look like the more credible business. Will it turn some people away? Yes, it will. But it will attract certain kinds of other customers too. Something to think about. All right, well, my call to action today is I want you to reflect on this list of 10 things, 10 different ways to create social proof and credibility and brand authority. And I want you to think about one or two that maybe you're not doing and just test it. And if you don't have time to do that right now, that's fine. Maybe write it down. Write it down somewhere. And when you have some time this winter, I want you to create a small little system that's repeatable in your business so that this particular trigger, credibility trigger, fires on a regular basis. So if that means that I'm going to create a testimonial um, acquisition system so that I can get testimonials. And then I'm going to store those testimonials somewhere. I'm going to get try to get 20 really good testimonials. And then I'm going to create a weekly post. I'm even going to pre-do them all in the winter. And I'm just going to cycle those 20 posts or not even that many. Like my top five testimonial posts are just going to recycle. I'm going to reuse them every five weeks. They're on a new rotation and they're going to be in my social media. Okay, that's an example of turning something like this into a system. Or maybe you're going to say, um, I'm going to add an element on my website where um, I have a st some statistics. Or maybe you're going to make sure you have a reviews widget on your website and you're going to add a call to action button right underneath it, right? Like pick one or two things that you're going to test and just see if it makes a difference. You don't need to do all of these things, just a few, but think back to that story I told you about the lawyer. It wasn't just one credibility measure that was working on me. There were multiple moments throughout the buyer's journey. There were some that were happening on the front end before I decided to buy when I was exploring and researching. And there were some that were happening during the actual experience itself. And all of those things uh, encourage the customer to continue to buy from you and validate that they made the right decision so that they turn into a super fan. All right, well, I hope that this was helpful and it gave you some food for thought. If you liked today's episode, you can find the show notes at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 176. Now, if you want to get onto my email list, I have some free marketing guru stuff to send your way that's going to turn you into a better marketer. It's like a three-month weekly email series that seriously gives you my best stuff away for free and it just walks you through the stuff you need to know in the right order. It's so, so good. I redid it um, last spring 
And I really encourage you, if you, especially if you don't know what you're doing when it comes to marketing, just get on my email list. And you can always unsubscribe if you're getting sick of it, okay? But it, you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash subscribe, super easy. And that will be my gift to you. It's going to help you out a ton. Thanks for joining me today, guys. That's all I got. Have a wonderful week. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.